Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. After season two premiered is what I would call a forgotten season. Perhaps it was because of the long delay between seasons that I got lost in the now hypermania that is the content wars. Dreaming had become the new thing and prestige television was beginning to fall out of favor, being replaced by mediocre nostalgia filled shows like Stranger Things. In other words, children's shows had become the norm. And they still are, listeners. Adult dramas are barely advertised any longer, barely given any promotion at all to a wide audience. But Stranger Things and other mediocre content mill monstrosities are given merchandise stores on the Las Vegas Strip. Yes, I just drove by an official Stranger Things merchandise store while on Las Vegas Boulevard the other day, like it was a Disney store. The age of prestige television is over, it seems. Sure, there are still some great shows coming out of places like HBO occasionally on Prime or another streamer, but they are never of the same quality of shows like True Detective. But rewatching season three reminded me of just how good this television series actually is. I'd even go as far as to say season three might be my favorite season of the entire series. Even beating out season one, the setting and tone call back to the original season. The rural Arkansas setting, the suburbs, the backwoods of a lesser traveled part of the country, the cultural middle America vibes on display in season one are put to good use here as well, making the setting a character of the show again. It makes clear that we are talking about a specific sect of people in a specific sect of America. The way of life, the many facets of its environment, all being used to the story's advantage. And the story in this season is intoxicating. There are no serial killers, no cults, no corrupt land deals, just one thing leading to another. And it is so damn good and enjoyable to watch. I have no problem saying this is my favorite season of True Detective. It might just be Mahershala Ali's performance as the lead, Detective Wayne Hayes, that makes this season of True Detective so damn good and appealing. Ali is tasked with an enormous role for an actor, playing a character that we see in many different parts of his life. As a young detective in 1980, when the case first breaks, a middle-aged man down on his luck and career in 1990, when the case opens back up for further investigation, and then in the present day of 2019, as a 70-year-old man suffering from the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. The absolute range of Ali's acting on display in this role is like nothing that has been done on television before or since. And the emotional range and scope of the character is fully explored because of these different time periods all coming together to tell the whole story. I'll even go this far, listeners. Ali blows McConaughey out of the water. That's right, I said it. Ali's performance makes McConaughey's look almost corny. Almost, as Russ Cole is still a great performance. 
And Russ Cole had many great lines in season one and a very dark personality that made him interesting. But the pure acting and emotional range by Ali in season three is perhaps the best acting of the entire series. I don't know why Ali has not been cast in more roles since this. He is one of the best living actors we have right now. The story for season three follows a much more standard and less dark plotline. Two children go missing in an Arkansas suburb in 1980, and it starts off with a bang. The overall tone is mesmerizing, haunting, as the viewer takes in this forgotten world of Arkansas in the 1980s and 1990s. Brilliant performances from even the tiniest of roles, a brief conversation with a witness, a brief exchange in a bar. This level of small, minor, insignificant characters in the series is on the level of the Coen brothers. And I don't say that lightly, listeners. I'm a huge fan of the Coen brothers, almost everything they do. Nick Pizzolatto was the sole writer for the project yet again, and even directs several of the episodes, all of which deserved much more play at the Emmys. It's a disgrace there wasn't more awarded to the series overall. With these three seasons of television, it's safe to say that Pizzolatto is one of the best crime fiction and thriller writers in television history. The layers that he manages to put in place and peel back, being revealed little by little, is unrivaled by any other big crime show. Breaking Bad and its many Emmy Awards can't touch this level of drama. Being able to rewatch this season a few hours at a time with streaming now in place, I couldn't wait to watch the next episode and the next, watching the entire thing in two four-hour chunks, more or less, staying up and losing sleep to keep going. The eight episodes in this season are perfect, nearly perfect, and the reveal at the end of The Winding Road is better than the previous two seasons by far. The art of storytelling is a character in this season, or at least some form of the story itself, which is a very smart design, and it isn't pompous or a joke. It actually works. Using the narratives crafted around the missing children, confusion, the steps a detective must take to make sense of a case, the legends and stories around the town itself are all used as integral parts of the story and drama creation for viewers. The many twists and turns are all part of how each person describes the story as they see it. New clues leading to another story, complicating previous ones, then being smashed to pieces with another piece of evidence. It uses story to help drive the narrative itself, and masterfully, the pain of a detective working on a case like this, one that lasts decades, that haunts them their entire lives, is captured better than any other crime drama I've ever watched. And that might be due to Ali. His work on this project is better than anything else he's ever done. Better than his Oscar-winning performance, even. The absolute pain he is able to capture in this character, and not just from speaking either, but the careful articulation from expression only, as the character of Wayne is a man of few words. It is nothing short of breathtaking when he's on screen. I cannot believe that Ali is not in more things. He is one of our great actors alive right now, and yes, as I said, I put that up against McConaughey's Rust Cole. And while Ali's Wayne Hayes isn't as what some would call cool, the character himself is a deeply complex study of life, happiness, confusion, determination, obsession, love, memory loss, friendship, principles, all of it. 
It is one of the most emotionally complex dramas I've ever seen for a crime series. I can't say enough about this season of television. This eight hour block is some of the greatest crime drama I've ever witnessed. And of course, it isn't just Ali in the series. His partner and lifelong friend, Detective Roland West, played by Stephen Dorff, is right there with him, taking on the more professionally astute side, the more talkative role, filling the Woody Harrelson style of Marty Hart from season one, but without the sex fiend qualities, and a much more sympathetic willingness to do the right thing his moral compass even more sturdy than Wayne's throughout the series. One of the most powerful scenes in this entire series is when Roland and Wayne are shown to meet up with one another many years later. Two men in their 70s, Wayne suffering from memory loss to the point he doesn't even remember why they haven't seen each other in 25 years. The emotional outpouring between these two men in that scene on that porch in rural Arkansas is some of the best television ever made. Yes, I said it. Show me something better than that. I dare you. The complex dynamic between the two, the lifelong haunting that each man has had to face from this unsolved case from over 40 years ago, the sheer scale of this project is perhaps what entices me so much. As a writer and a viewer, I admire the ambition, and then, even more so, the successful pulling off of such a large-scale timeline, the moving parts, the back and forth from decade to decade, is all done seamlessly. It's the most ambitious project of crime fiction I've ever seen on TV. And I know I've said that a few times already, listeners, but it bears repeating. This is the most criminally underrated season of True Detective out there. Scoot McNary, another terribly undercast actor in Hollywood right now, is incredible as Tom, the secretly gay, alcoholic father of the missing children. His character acting abilities are often underused in many of his more prominent roles I've seen, but not in True Detective Season 3, listeners. He is allowed to shine even with the minor part he plays in the story. Wayne's wife, Amelia, played by Carmen Iogo, is another underrated part of the show. One of the few times I've seen this third detective role work in such a way, the storytelling aspect being used through her and the detective work, as well as the domestic drama of being Wayne's wife. Her story of using the crime of the missing children in a breakthrough nonfiction true crime book is woven through the plot masterfully, and she isn't over-sexualized or made tough or some other unbelievable mark of what has become known as the, quote, strong female character trope that is endlessly shoved down our throats. She actually is a strong female character but doesn't have to beat anyone up or be tough or use a gun to be so. Amelia pushes her husband, even after her death, when Wayne's an old man, into solving the case, even coming to him in visions as he slowly loses his mind from the awful disease. And the idea of using her as an instrument in the final reveal of what happened to Lucy, the kidnapped girl missing since 1980, is utterly brilliant and original. It is surprisingly smooth for such a reveal, as well as a nod to the old crime pulp classics of the early 20th century, where most of the mystery is revealed at the end in a dialogue or massive monologue. Her small monologue at the end about storytelling and narrative, where the final plot twist is revealed, is nothing short of great, elevated by the way it comes to Ali's sorrowful eyes in all that old man makeup. It is one of the best used devices in the series. And maybe that's why I'm so drawn to season three, even more than season one, which may surprise some listeners, I know. 
It's this use of almost every device in the crime pulp fiction toolbox that elevates this season. That and the god tier acting by Ali, who seems to elevate every other actor on the screen. There isn't a rich family high in their corruption, though there is some of that. There isn't a big villain revealed at the end, though we do get a reveal. There is simply a grounded story that takes wild and wicked turns as the plot unfolds on screen. I didn't want it to end. In fact, I already want to watch it again, just for Ali's brilliance on screen. And I haven't even gotten to the various subplots that only enhance the story. The grizzled Native American Vietnam veteran who is falsely accused of kidnapping the children by other neighbors in the town, all without evidence, and this haunting, the haunting that is so real, not fantasy or supernatural, real, the haunting that can only happen to a person after years of dwelling on a mystery that evades them. And this is what True Detective Season 3 really captures. The haunting of a cold case from 45 years earlier. Sticking with the detectives their entire lives. Never able to forget it. Even when going through Alzheimer's. A crime drama of this magnitude and scale has never been achieved before. And I don't think it will ever be again. Pizzolatto deserved an Emmy Award for this series for the originality alone, not to mention the tough dialogue and race relations written so smoothly into the scripts. And yet, this season is forgotten, dismissed. But it shouldn't be, listeners. Season 3 of True Detective is simply one of the greatest works of crime drama ever made. <laughs> Heavy. Bored. The fourth season of True Detective, what HBO has called True Detective Night Country, was not something I expected to see ever get made. It actually surprised me to see the ads for it all over the place when it was being marketed. Something I hadn't seen for a True Detective series in years, since the third season aired in 2019. But this fourth installment of the anthology series that aired in 2024 is, I'm sorry to say, a mess. And that is being kind, listeners. This installment has a new creator, and the difference in quality is stark. And I'm not talking about the usual HBO cinematography and budgets. That all seems on par. But I am talking about the writing and direction Nick Pizzolatto, the show's original creator, who I had just spent the last few hours of podcast praising, is completely uninvolved with the project. And it shows. It shows in almost every creative decision that was seemingly made about this project. In fact, his name is only listed in the credits as a quote, based on the series True Detective created by Nick Pizzolatto, close quote. And that's it. Then there is a separate creator credit. Why? Well, I don't know. I've never seen this type of credit given for a season of television before in my life. Even if the original creator and showrunner leaves a series, usually the credit for creator still goes to, well, the actual creator. But for True Detective Night Country, the creator is listed as Issa Lopez, someone I have never heard of, but apparently was given the keys to one of HBO's most successful crime drama series. Looking up her past work, it is unclear what the executives at HBO thought when hiring her for this role. Her credits consist of three movies I've never heard of, and then a whole host of Spanish-language TV series that only ever aired in Mexico. Usually, HBO looks for creatives that have garnered some success somewhere before handing over total control of a series to them. But in this case, it's clear Lopez was unqualified for the job, but was given full control anyway. 
and I don't say that lightly, listeners. The Rotten Tomatoes score for this season of television follows the usual Rotten Tomatoes phenomenon, that of audiences thinking it was mediocre, and the so-called professional critics thinking it was the best season of True Detective since the iconic and groundbreaking first season. I have to say, listeners, any critic that says this fourth season is on par with any of the previous three is lying. I don't believe them. Or their taste is so atrocious, they can't be called serious critics. This fourth installment of the series is objectively bad in almost every aspect. I'd go as far as to call the writing on this show CW level, which is bad, corny, not thought out, cheap. This is NCIS level television writing if I have ever seen it, but actually worse than your average CSI or NCIS episode, whose stories are often quick and self-contained in a single 45-minute episode. This is a huge downgrade from the usual stellar writing we see on HBO dramas, let alone what Pizzolatto was able to achieve with those first three seasons of True Detective. Prestige Television got its reputation for the very fact that it was better made and better written than what we would call network TV. And I have to wonder, who is in charge at Warner Brothers right now? And what were they thinking? After damaging HBO's reputation by combining it with HBO Max in branding, a mistake they have since corrected, whoever is in charge seems to actively hate the HBO brand, or at least wants to degrade it, misunderstand it. Trying their best to distinguish the absolute garbage that they have produced during the streaming wars with that Max original label slapped over top of the many bottom-of-the-barrel shows that have been produced. Trying desperately to separate the garbage television written by children from the famous HBO series that have cleaned up the Emmys for decades, all in order to save the brand of HBO a brand they suddenly seem intent on destroying. True Detective Night Country really seems like more of a Max original show than an HBO show. And with that careless destruction, so goes the brand of True Detective, a series that captured something with a genre that had been worn out and played to death on network TV. As I've already said many times, True Detective elevated the crime drama genre like we had never seen before. But now, with True Detective Night Country, that has been brought back down to less than mediocre. And executives at HBO seem to want to continue with the mediocrity by giving Lopez another season to happily destroy the legacy of this series. Like I said, it makes me wonder who is in charge at HBO and if they have any taste at all. Because the decisions recently, since Succession has ended, seem to prove they have no idea what good and bad actually looks like or feels like. My first impressions with Night Country were mixed. The setting was the best part of the season as is the case in previous seasons of True Detective, but it struck me as a misguided direction when the supernatural elements were introduced almost immediately. The supernatural and ghosts and whispers only certain people can hear are there to cover up the lack of story. This level of supernatural was completely out of the world of True Detective which had always been a gritty, realistic style of storytelling. There was no magical realism. Honestly, it was a slog to watch. I turned off the series during my first attempt to watch it, as it aired, after episode two, absolutely disgusted with the creative choices. This was after the opening sequence in episode two, where after the jumble of bodies are discovered frozen into the ice in the, around the Arctic Circle, A survivor screams to life after having one of his limbs broken off. 
That's right. The writer, Issa Lopez, wants us as viewers to believe that after being naked in sub-zero weather for over 72 hours, that a human being can survive with organ and brain function intact. This violation of the laws of physics is so childish that I was disgusted by how stupid she thinks the audience is and turned off the show immediately, disappointed. I only went back to finish it for this review on the podcast, listeners, always trying to give anything I review a fair shake, and I mostly suffered through it. The writing is amateur level at best, a shocking amount of bad dialogue, usually reserved for Netflix originals, and a plot that seems as if it were originally a horror movie script stretched out for six hours to pitch as a TV series, completely disconnected from the true detective stories of the previous seasons. Why this season only has six episodes is really not clear to me. Not that two more hours of this meandering would have been much better, but it does strike me that maybe there were some apprehensions at HBO about greenlighting this half-assed project. And half-assed is an understatement. I've never seen an HBO show with such poor writing before. House of the Dragon was pretty bad writing to the point I couldn't finish the first season. But this is, like I said on the level of something that should have been airing on the CW network. And apart from the liberal use of the word fuck as punctuation, almost everything that occurs in this fourth season could have aired on the CW with no edits or cuts. There is no nudity. Even during the sex scenes, everyone wears bras and t-shirts during sex in this show. And the level of violence is that of maybe a PG-13 rating. The dead bodies that keep coming up as visions in the season are all out of the ring from 2002, just decayed, open-mouthed, and dark around the eyes. The visuals are all directional misses. And it's without surprise that Lopez directed each episode in this short season with questionable decisions all over it often cutting so needlessly out of a scene where we are giving some new information from a witness to then cut to the detectives talking about that very information in a room, repeating what we just saw and heard. Amateur-level directing decisions, if I've ever seen them. Lopez doesn't seem to know how to carry tension in a scene, and the pacing was so inconsistent and all over the place, the events stop and start constantly. It was baffling to me. And at the level of a prestige, big-budget HBO series, it is downright flabbergasting. The use of the word fuck, said by every character all the time, is a writing weakness. Quote, shut the fuck up is used all the time as a call and answer in the dialogue. It was disgustingly amateurish. And no, it isn't because I'm squeamish about the word. In fact, it is used in all the seasons of True Detective, but because when it is used so often, it loses its force. Usually when using fuck in scripted dialogue, it is to show anger or intensity, or even some form of importance, maybe even frustration. But with the dialogue in Night Country, it is used all the time for any reason, and it is a weakness. It leaves out instances of actual meaningful conversation and back and forth, and more than that, it makes every character sound the same, as if they were all written by the same person, Isa Lopez. And that person, Isa Lopez, has writing skill levels that border on college freshman creative writing courses. Which brings me to another writing criticism. The plot. The discovery. There is no discovery. No sequence of events. 
There are no clues that lead the detectives on a hunt or piece by piece let the viewer see what is being discovered. Peeling back the layers, as I've referred to before, every piece of information that matters to the plot is delivered in dialogue by characters that show up for a brief second, introduced by dialogue, and then they leave. A veterinarian comes in, explained in dialogue who he is, and says, the huddle of dead bodies they found don't seem to be dead by the cold, but fright says he's seen animals die of fright before. My jaw dropped. This is worse than NCIS-level writing. Much worse. Then we get another random character entering into a laundromat for some reason, introduced by dialogue that explains the spiral symbol is a warning for ice caves in the frozen tundra of northern Alaska. Then he's gone. This is what I'm talking about, listeners, and those are pivotal pieces of information we should have gotten in the first two episodes. And both of those pieces of information are delivered in episode four, over the halfway point. Most of the evidence or clues presented to viewers just simply disappear. The phone video, which tells us nothing and tells the police nothing, is seen about a dozen times, over and over again. And then there's the tongue, the first intriguing piece of evidence presented in the first episode. It just disappears. There is no explanation. There is no use for it being a clue. It is simply gone. Again, I say it, this is amateur writing. HBO should be ashamed of themselves for filming and then airing this. They have shelved series for worse offenses. Say what you will about the first three seasons of True Detective, but every single piece of evidence presented to the viewer matters, as it should. When a clue doesn't matter, or doesn't lead to at least a red herring, it is cheap, listeners. Cheap writing. Cheating. We waste so much time in this series, it really strikes me as lost, plotless, Most of the runtime is the two women talking about something that never occurred in the series. A memory, crying on each other's shoulders. But more importantly, none of it moves the plot forward. The sad, weak attempts to give the characters depth, a backstory, are all done through flashback. Another cheap writing technique. Flashback is easier than actually giving them a monologue or writing it into a conversation or some trait that keeps coming back. Jesus, I can't get over how this was even made. This was definitely a poor attempt at a feminist telling of a detective story. All of the main characters are women and they all act like men. And all the male characters act like women. This has become the trope that people cling to when they claim to be writing some sort of feminist story, making women men and men women. The male love interests are all doting wives, especially Trooper Navarro's. Her little fuckboy cooks her food, cleans her wounds, and tells her to be safe and come back when she goes to do dangerous things like police work. And he's supposed to be some sort of bootlegger or something, running a bar, a tough guy who takes bubble baths and makes her waffles. And this is all supposed to be taking place in a small rural town in Alaska. It was disgusting to watch. And Lopez herself has been lashing out at any critics of her objectively bad TV series as incels and fanboys degrading the show's viewers and whining about criticism publicly while claiming victim at the same time, a sour grapes approach to professional filmmaking, a pathetic self-conscious way of pretending to be professional. What you may notice is that every female character in these ham-fisted types of scripts is simply portrayed as Sylvia Plath, a woman who hates herself, hates her children, hates her husband, and is also a genius, didn't you know? 
The minor part of Peter Pryor, played by Finn Bennett, who is not given much to work with, is relegated to being a whiny housewife, constantly apologizing to his wife for working, his wife, of course, being Sylvia Plath, blaming her husband for ruining her life, and, of course, I'd like to point out, we get more character development from Pryor's wife, who is in the show all of maybe a minute and a half, than we do of the actual officer working the investigation, Pryor himself. Which is why his moral righteousness toward the end of the show is completely unearned, and another example of amateur-level cheap writing. More importantly, Callie Reyes, playing Trooper Navarro, can't act. And not that she is given anything to act, really, but it is glaring in every scene. The dialogue is so bad, even Jodie Foster couldn't save it, while she screams, shut the fuck up, constantly, as a leader of a police force and murder investigation. I cringed almost every time there was a blow-up and the word fuck was thrown around as punctuation. There is actually so much bad character development in the show, we don't even have any evidence about the dead bodies that actually start the season. The entire show becomes about a dead girl from six years ago trying to solve that murder instead of the eight dead bodies they find in the snow. Why? Well because the writing is bad, directionless, and every relationship is surface level. We get no deeper understanding of Navarro's sister and her Sylvia Plath problems. We get no understanding of Jodie Foster's stepdaughter and her Sylvia Plath problems. We don't even get much of Hank Pryor, played by John Hawks, or any understanding of his resentments or grudges. Again, bad writing, because he just shows up as a villain whenever the show needs him to. This is a joke of a crime drama, more preoccupied with being a horror movie than a crime drama show. And this brings us to Jodie Foster, really the most talented actor in the show. And boy, can she not even save the character because it is written so badly. Liz Danvers, the lead detective in season four, is written like a sloppy plate of rice and beans. There is no depth apart from flashbacks to her dead son and constant references to her fucking everyone in town and being, you guessed it, Sylvia Plath not sorry about it. Now, the main problem with this is that it is supposed to be a small town. And if you've ever lived in a small town, you'd know that if you were fucking someone, everyone knows. But more importantly, Foster is too old for the role. It's hard to believe that a 60-year-old woman in a small town Alaska is this total MILF who fucks anything that walks out of a compulsion or, yes, you guessed it, her own Sylvia Plath reasons. Look, I love Jodie Foster, but she was miscast in this show, or the writing was just so bad there was just nothing she could do. I was tempted to turn this show off three more times since I decided to actually watch to the end for this review. Again, after episode two, when I sat down for my second attempt, and again, after episode three, and again, after episode four, the show goes so far off the rails that I really felt annoyed as it went on. It was wasting my time. I was just waiting for it to end not even looking forward to the next event. It was a chore to finish, and surprise, surprise, the ending is disappointing and completely unearned. All of it explained through dialogue, of course. And that's due to the writing as well. Even when the pivotal moments happen, for example, the key witness being killed in Liz's home, at the same time as her main deputy being killed in her home, all in the same scene, the show just moves on. It doesn't even matter. The two women leave the man to clean up, handing him a cleaning bottle, and they just leave, like it didn't even happen. I keep saying it, but this is amateur-level writing. There have to be consequences for something so large happening in the chief of police's house. Every major event like this 
is just diminished by the consequences being zero for the story or the characters. The only thing that somewhat disguises the bad writing is the high budget and great cinematography that HBO provides for each of their shows. And this fourth season, with a specifically different name than the previous three, only lasts a few days. Not even a month in terms of the actual case. When every other season is years long, the third season even going as long as over 45 years. The theme of detectives being haunted by unsolved cases from years ago is out the window. Instead, we get ancient Indian voodoo crap that only Navarro can see and hear, and it keeps recurring without revealing any information. I couldn't stand it. I still can't stand it. This is the worst season of True Detective that could ever have been made. And it will be remembered as less than mediocre, no matter how many critics lie and say it's great on Rotten Tomatoes. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard.